We're going to get started here. Thank you. I want to welcome you, uh, everyone, to DV's Service and Legislative Seminar. I'm Jim Marzak, DV's National Service Director, and I'm joined by Julie Elam, DV's National Legislative Director, your co-host for today's seminar. As we have done in the past several years, we will be having a candid conversation with senior leaders at the Department of Veterans Affairs about some of the most critical challenges and policies affecting veterans, burn pits, toxic exposures, VA health care, and benefits. But before we begin, we want to introduce each of our special guests and allow them a few minutes to make any opening remarks. For now, I'll turn it over to Joy. Thanks, Jim. I'm pleased to introduce VA Chief of Staff, Dr. Ryun Sa. Dr. Sa was appointed as the Department of Veterans Affairs, Veterans Health Administration Chief of Staff on June 4th, 2023 previously serving as Senior Advisor to the Undersecretary for Health. Dr. Saab brings three decades of executive management and organizational leadership experience and expertise at the nexus of clinical care, business strategy and operations, and healthcare management and policy. Dr. Saab was commissioned through the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and completed his medical, public policy, and business management studies at Georgetown University, and his public health <coughs> studies were at the F. Edward Hebert School of Medicine at the Uniform Services University. He is a board certified in occupational medicine and is a fellow of the American College of Preventative Medicine and a fellow of the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. Colonel Sa served as an infantry and medical corps officer for 26 years in the United States Army with a diverse set of operational, special operations, and military health system responsibilities. He is a combat veteran who served as a task force surgeon during, his op during Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, where he was awarded the Bronze Star Medal. He has, a multi he has had multiple overseas deployments throughout his Army career, and his military qualifications include airborne, ranger, jump master, and flight surgeon. Dr. Sa is a service-connected disabled veteran who received care and support from the VA upon his military retirement. I'm also pleased to note that he is a lifetime member of DAV and hails from the great state of Texas. Please join me in welcoming VHA's Chief of Staff, Dr. Ryung Sa. Dr. Sa? Come right yep, now? go ahead. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, great to be here today. Uh, as uh, Joy mentioned, I was in the Army. I was in the Army for uh, 26 years, and as a life member of DAV, it's uh, great to be with my veteran brothers and sisters today. Um, it's also great to be uh, back in Jersey. I, I grew up in North Jersey, and um, uh, spent my summers down here in the Jersey Shore. Um, so, you know, it makes me feel very nostalgic to, um, you know, think back on my uh, misspent youth. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm happy to give you an update on our progress, on our efforts to provide more care and more benefits to more veterans than ever before. Um, I, w I think Joy mentioned this, but I am relatively new to the role. Uh, I, I uh, started the role in June. Um, so my uh, knowledge of all of the facts and figures are not as uh, deep as perhaps Mike's might be around some of his programs. So I, I do plan on uh, referring to my briefing book um, throughout the discussion. Um, so, you know, I think it kind of brings me back to my roots um, where I remember, you know, going to middle school and high school in Jersey and, and cheat sheets were definitely very prevalent back then. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I did want to share my thanks to, to Mike for um, uh, joining me on the panel and for answering all the hard questions. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Randy um, for inviting Dr. Elnahal and for um, allowing me as a um, older, fatter, slower replacement, uh, allowing me to slip in at the last minute. Um, I'd like to thank Joy and um, uh, Jim for moderating the panel and probably most importantly I'd like to thank all the veterans out there and all of you everyone in the room who supports uh, and remain dedicated to veterans and veterans issues 
Um, veteran service organizations are key partners in our mission to provide veterans with the care they've earned and deserved. Uh, you play a critical role in providing the feedback to us to help us improve on how we serve veterans. You've also played a major role in the rollout of the largest expansion of veteran benefits in generations and helping to spread the word about our benefits and helping veterans file claims under the, uh, under the PACT Act. This landmark piece of legislation is one that DAV and uh, VSOs in general have been fighting for and advocating for for many years. And your direct support is essential in helping veterans and uh, filling out their, uh, their claims. Um, you know, I, if it's okay, I, I would like to share a personal story to start. Um, and, you know, most of my 26 years in the Army, I was in um, highly deployable units. And, um, you know, I spent a great deal of time in the field. And um, I think during the latter half of my, uh, my career, when, you know, kind of my door kicking days were done and my new body habitus was starting to emerge, um, <laughs> You know, I spent my time caring for soldiers and providing healthcare services for soldiers and their families. And when I transitioned into uh, civilian life and began to kind of feel the wear and tear on my own body, it was actually the DAV chapter, or the DAV office in Virginia that helped me fill out my CMP um, application and get the disability benefits that, that I earned later. So I was so grateful to the DAV that I, I think as soon as that um, experience um, ended, I signed up as a life member of DAV. So it, I feel like it's a, kind of a complete circle to come back here um, and to have an opportunity to speak at the DAV National Convention in my new role as the VHA Chief of Staff. So the work you do is very, very important, and we thank you again for the uh, commitment you've shown to improving the lives of veterans. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Jim, back to you. Thank you, Joy. We are pleased uh, to have with us Mr. Michael Fru, the Principal Deputy Undersecretary for Benefits, who has more than two decades of experience working at VBA. Mike is responsible for administrating benefit programs for veterans, including education, home loan guarantee, insurance, disability compensation, pension, fiduciary, transition assistance, and veteran readiness and employment. He has also held several other important positions in VBA, including Assistant Deputy Undersecretary for Field Operations for the Benefits Assistance Service, VBA Chief of Staff, and Executive Director for VBA's Loan Guarantee Service. Mike is a graduate from Pepperdine University in Malibu, California, with an MBA from George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and has also worked in the private sector for PricewaterhouseCoopers, Bankers Trust, and Anderson Consulting. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to VBA's Principal Deputy Undersecretary, Mike Fruit. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Joy. And Dr. Sa, it's really nice to be able to share the stage with you. And I sure hope I can take some tough questions for you. But I appreciate you by my side. And I want to say, and I want to start with what Dr. Sa finished with, which is, Thanks to you, this is your 101st convention. And we talk about delivering more care and more benefits to more veterans more quickly and more equitably than ever before. And we cannot do it ourselves. Even though I have 30,000 people working along with me at VBA and another 450,000 or so in Dr. Sa's world trying to deliver care and benefits that veterans earned, it's hard for us to reach them. And the way that I've develop my relationship in the last 20 years with DAV and with VSOs is, is we can provide a lot of resources. I have money that we're delivering about $3 billion a week just in compensation benefits to veterans. And that's every single week, $150 billion last year, probably 175 or so billion this year. So it's gonna quickly go to about $3.5 billion a week, plus education benefits and home loan guarantee benefits. So I can provide those resources. I can provide uh, access to systems, but it's very hard for us to reach that last mile, make that connection with veterans around the country. And just like you met Ryan, where he needed to be met and help him access his benefits, that what we, that's what we've seen and that's what we rely on throughout the future for the 19.1 or so million veterans that are in the country today, that serve their country today, that earn benefits, and maybe 
10 million of them don't access their benefits. So there's a lot more that we want to reach out to and we rely on you and county and state servicing officers to help us. So thank you and thank all of you for that. So in the 101st anniversary of, or maybe it's 100th anniversary of your first convention, there's a lot of other anniversaries recently. When I came to VA, I came from international mortgage finance and I came to help out in the home loan program, which I love. So the GI Bill turned 79 this year. GI Bill is education, GI Bill is home loan, GI Bill is vocational rehabilitation. But home loan is the one that I loved. And the very first person that used a home loan was Captain Miles Meyer in DC, who bought a house for the hefty price tag of $5,000 in 1944. So his army captain, uh, first one to use it, the SAH program just turned 75 this last month. And the first person that used the SAH program bought a house in 1948, I guess, 49, for $9,500. And the SAH program paid for all of it. Of course, it's not enough to pay for all of it now, but it's adapted a lot over the year. We had a, an anniversary just the other week. I went to a 75th anniversary of SAH in Chicago at a disabled veterans home called Ken Laurent. Ken Laurent is notable because he was a paraplegic who wrote Frank Lloyd Wright and said, I love the work that you do. I would love you to build a house for me or design a house for me. So Frank Lloyd Wright wrote back and said, I can't promise you you can afford me, but I would love to work with you and build you a house. And he built a house with disabilities 50 years before the ADA came out, the American with Disabilities Act, that has most of the things that the ADA covers. And that special adapted housing veterans for 50 years, 75 years now since then, have relied on to get into their house, to get into their kitchen, to use their house in the manner that they need to, to conduct their activities of daily living. So that's another anniversary that we've gone through recently. And of course, we've got the anniversary of the PACT Act which yep. we talk about as one of the most expansive uh, expansion, the biggest expansion of benefits in history, probably since the GI Bill, which is 79 years. I hope that I am not still talking 79 years from now about the PACT Act, but it has been a really, really big deal at VA. We spent a lot of time planning for it. We spent a lot of time implementing it this year, relying a lot on you, DAV, and all of your servicing officers around the country to implement it. And we'll talk more about it throughout this panel. But I really look forward to talking to you and sharing what we've done this past year. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started with the questions. Dr. Sa, the first one will be for you, but we'll, we'll try to take it easy. We'll give you a little bit of slack <laughs> with, you know, two months uh, there. But anyway, one of DAV's key legislative goals is to expand VA's healthcare capacity. We want to ensure that service disabled veterans who need and want to use the VA for their care have access to timely, high quality services. And however, over the past year, VA has routinely had to offer veterans care or care in the community because of timeliness standards uh, can't be met. We know that healthcare staffing shortages are prevalent uh, throughout the United States and at VA and competition for hiring healthcare providers is fierce. Could you just um, tell us what VHA's plans are to fill the thousands of existing clinical vacancies and maybe talk a little <coughs> bit about the specific challenges the department faces in regard to you know, recruiting and retaining and hiring uh, quality doctors, nurses, and other clinical staff? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, if you look at the backdrop to, <clears throat> to what's going on in the healthcare labor market itself, there is a healthcare worker shortage that is impacting every healthcare system out there. Part of it may be due to the pandemic. I think there is a new phenomenon of uh, what's known as provider burnout and staff burnout generally, where a lot of people are leaving the workforce itself. And so what we end up seeing is that almost every occupational series, almost every labor category that is out there is impacted by the, the labor shortages. So as an example, home health um, uh, aides, I think we have a shortage of 446,000 is the projection of the deficit in home health aides. Um, I think we have a 95,000 um, shortage when it comes to nursing assistants. We have a 29,000 um, shortage of nurse practitioners. So this is a really kind of a broad-based problem itself. 
However, in terms of what um, the VA, VHA has done, the VHA started this year um, with three very ambitious goals. Number one, we decided that um, we wanted to target 52,000 hires for this year. 52,000 hires is the, uh, the largest number of hires in v, uh, that VHA has hired in its 75 year history. We also set a goal of achieving a 3% growth rate. And then we wanted to also hire 30,000 employees in what we call the big seven um, occupations. These are the occupations where we have some very critical needs and these are very hard to hire occupations. So they include things like physicians, nurses, housekeeping aides, medical support assistants, nursing assistants, licensed practical nurses, and food service workers. So with these three goals in mind, uh, we're about three quarters into the, uh, the year, the fiscal year, um, and we are doing really well, actually, against our goals, our, against our hiring and growth go goals. So, so far, as of June 2023, we have hired 43,784 employees. That's the most the VHA has ever hired in the first nine months of any given year. It's also, it is also over um, 10,000 employees more than the same point in time this past year. We've also achieved a 4.9% growth rate, and our workforce has grown by uh, almost 19,000 employees overall. Our end strength now stands at almost 400,000 employees, and we've had our biggest growth rate in over 15 years. We've also hired 24,600 employees in our big seven occupations. So I think the other things that we're working on, we're working to make the um, VA and the VHA uh, in particular a better place to work. And the state of VHA's workforce is maybe healthier than it's ever been. For the second year in a row, the VA has been selected as one of the top five um, best places to work. Uh, we've made significant progress also in uh, implementing the Secretary's Human Infrastructure Plan. Uh, we've raised the federal worker minimum wage to $15 an hour. We've worked with Congress to pass the RAISE Act, which has helped us uh, raise wages for uh, 10,000 VA nurses. Uh, we've worked with Congress to pass the PACT Act, obviously, which uh, provides greater flexibility to offer higher salaries, bonuses, awards, um, and to increase the amount of additional supports and student assistance, things of that nature. We're also working closely with Congress on the VA Careers Act, which would give us an unprecedented ability to compete for top healthcare uh, talent. In a labor market that is facing significant labor market shortages, one of the restrictions that the VHA has traditionally had is that we have an upper cap on how much we can offer our healthcare workers. And sometimes the disparities between market-based prices and what our upper cap is are pretty significant. Um, and so I think we're trying to address that um, more proactively. Uh, we are also, uh, I was trying to uh, keep up with, uh, <laughs> I was trying to keep up with Mike because he rattled off all these like statistics off the top of his head. So uh, I was trying to like impress you as well, but <laughs> I, 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 I may- have a lot of detail. I do have a lot of detail. <laughs> um, what I will say is, despite a lot of the things and a lot of the progress that we've made across hiring and our workforce strategies in general, we still have some existing challenges, right? Our time to hire is, is, is relatively long. Right? So the process of identifying talent, getting them through the onboarding system is much longer than we want it to be. So we have concerted efforts to try to improve upon that onboarding process. We, we have teams that are working very, very hard to make sure that we have more efficiency in that onboarding process. Um, we're also taking the necessary steps to try to implement some incentives that we know will make a dis, uh, difference. So we're waiting for passage of, um, by OMB, of critical pay positions. These are some of our positions that are the most important, but that we have the hardest time hiring for. 
So we're waiting to implement that. We're very close to implementing um, um, some uh, critical skills incentives as well. So we're, we're working on things that they're not quite there yet, but we're almost there. I think the one last thing that I would add is um, we have a new program called the Integrated Critical Staffing Program. And that is an effort to ensure that if we have a vacancy and it takes us, you know, let's say seven, eight, nine months to fill that vacancy, that we have a centralized process for filling that vacancy while that hiring process is going on. So it, it's, a, it's a new innovative program that we will be launching in September. So we're, we're very, you know, optimistic about it. And I think the final comment, sorry for being so long, Mike, but uh, the, I think the final thing that I would say is, as I was taking a look at some of the many things that we're doing, it reminded me of, um, uh, you know, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, not to get too nerdy, but one of my favorite philosophers is a guy named Epictetus. And Epictetus um, would often say in Latin, he would say, um, ta femen, ta uca femen. All right, and that translates to what is up to us, what is not up to us. And when I look at the panoply of different initiatives that the VA is working on to improve upon hiring and improve upon the workforce, I think everything that is up to us, we are doing everything possible to try to make progress across these fronts. The things that are not up to us, the labor marketplace, the economy in general, legislative restrictions, things of that nature, that makes it hard for us to address those things effectively. But I think, again, we're making tremendous progress and we're very proud of the efforts that we've uh, accomplished so far. So. Well, thank you for such a thorough um, overview. I think that's really, overall, um, a good news story. And even though in progress, definitely a good news story because we know how much that contributes to you being able to provide timely appointments and we understand the challenges that are out there. Jim? Thank you, Joy. PAC deck. You know, we, we've heard, heard about it. it. <laughs> yeah, we've heard about it this morning from the secretary. Um, I, I will say that uh, for the audience that we do have DAV service officers upstairs. As soon as you get up the escalator, it's the first room on our left here. Service officers up there that can help you file your claim while you're here. So please take advantage of that. And since the, since the secretary spoke this morning, there's been 32 people that uh, we've already taken care of upstairs. So, um, and again, I, I think getting the word out is critical. And you mentioned it in your opening remarks. There's millions of veterans out there that don't know they may mm -hmm. be entitled to benefits. So, looking broadly over the past year, how would you grade VA on its implementation of the PACT Act? Uh, what do you think the most important things were that you did? And what are some areas you think we all could do better in? Well, it's interesting you talk about grading because my, my son's applying for colleges now and we were at an information session and, and the college admission said, you know, some schools rate kids on a zero to 5.5%, some do a zero to four, some do smiley faces and frowny faces instead of grades and I would give us a smiley face, probably a B plus or so in implement, implementation of the PACT Act because we knew this was coming a year before the PACT Act was signed into law. We didn't know whether it was going to be the House PACT Act or the Senate, was it called the C Cost of War Act? And you know, one was geared more around benefits, one was geared more around health care. So thankful to, uh, you're probably thankful it was the benefit side that, that went out when this came out. <laughs> but uh, we've been planning for a year. So over a year before the PACT Act started, v VBA, uh, toxic exposure work group was meeting with the VHA toxic exposure group called VA Home uh, with our new group and they were looking at how can we decide uh, an eligible disease for disability for a presumptive rather than using the traditional National Acad Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine or NASM uh, studies and they really opened the doors. They said we can look at IFFF, the International Firefighters Foundation, what are they looking at as diseases from toxic exposures or burn pit-like things that firemen suffer. Look at other bodies of evidence outside of NASEM, published scientific documents, as well as look at VBA 
uh, claims data as evidence supporting the potential for something to be a presumptive. So they kind of opened the aperture. And if you remember, that resulted in three new presumptives, the asthma, sinusitis, and rhinitis, about a year before uh, the, the Toxic Exposure Act, or PACT Act, came out. And then we started hiring for it, saying we know there's going to be a lot of appetite for this in the public. So we hired 2,000 people a year before PACT came out, or during the course of that year. That was a tremendous year for us. Just as Ryung mentioned that they set records in hiring this past year, we did the year before PAC came out. And then as PAC came out and we said, oh my gosh, there's 23 presumptives, which covers about 300 different diagnoses uh, or diseases that fortunately includes rhinitis, sinusitis, and, and asthma. So that's three we don't have to worry about. We've already done them, but 20 more that we had to worry about. We have taken, uh, I guess we put our foot on the accelerator as far as we could for hiring. So this past year we hired over 10,000 people and we were only 30,000 strong now, which is the most we've ever been. We're not 10,000 stronger than before. We're only about 5,000 stronger than we were at the beginning of the year because for almost every hire that we, we make, it takes two or three hires to fill because people move up in their careers. So to hire a raider, we usually hire a developer. So our VSR comes from the VSR pool. VSR pool comes from yeah, maybe a phone technician in the National Call Center. And then we get a new person at the back of the the run. So all of our hiring actions, we're hiring faster, we're training faster, we're getting people up to speed faster. We can see that in our end strength. I would say that we are producing claims a whole lot faster than ever before. Three years ago, we set a record in claims production with about one and a half million claims. Two years ago, we beat that record by about 12%. This year, we're 16% ahead of where we were last year, which was another record. So this will be four years in a row of record claims production. Again, three years ago, we used to produce about 6,000 claims a day in a big day, like a very good day we could hang our hat on. Last year, we were producing 7,000 claims a day regularly. This year, we hit 8,000 claims a day, 83 days so far this year. We had 9,000 claims a day twice, both in the last month and we're 16% ahead of production last year. So that's good, that's where I'd say we get an A for doing things to get better. We did that by hiring, we did that by a lot of automation that your former national commander, Rob Reynolds, is in charge of in the department, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but those are the good things. The other part that's equally good that causes a little bit of trouble for us is our outreach has been tremendous. Secretary says get in line and file a claim and people are getting in line and filing a claim. We've done a lot of paid advertising, more than we've ever done before. We're leveraging every type of media possible to tell veterans, the veterans that we know of, the nine million or so that we have a relationship with today, but more so trying to reach the nine or 10 million that we don't have any relationship with about these benefits, because PAC benefits predate the Vietnam War and they go all the way up to today. So there's veterans that might not have been eligible for a benefit before, today they are. And we're trying to get the word out, as the Secretary said, by next Wednesday, because that's the one year anniversary of the PACT Act. And if a veteran has a disability that manifested before the PACT Act was signed, and if they can apply or file an intent to file by next Wednesday, then they could get backdated benefits all the way to last year. So the outreach is a good and a bad thing. And here's where it gets problematic is, we have gotten more claims in this year than any other year before. I said we're 16% ahead in production, which is great. I will pat everyone on the back here that's helping us do claims, and all of our people in the audience are in the, the field offices that are helping decide claims, but it's the 36% higher incoming that is causing us to say, how else can we do work better? We are not gonna stop hiring anytime soon because we're get, we've so far gotten 1.6 million claims in this year, about a month and a half faster than we got it in last year. So even though we're doing work faster, we have more people doing the work, it's more equitable, it's more efficient to get to the end decision, we are getting so much more work in the door. And that's just on the claim side because every new eligible service-connected veteran is now potentially eligible for VRE or a funding fee-free mortgage or other benefits, certainly healthcare in VHA, and that's just adding to the workload across VA. So I would say B plus, B, definitely a happy face for implementing the PACT Act, and we hear so many stories about 
veterans and especially survivors make me happiest when they were not eligible for anything for years and now all of a sudden the loved one that passed away is determined to be passed away for something that would have been eligible for PACTAC benefits and so now they can access the care that they should have had before. Well, I'll tell you that the collaboration, and I would agree, it's certainly a smiley face uh, in our <laughs> opinion as well. Um, the collaboration, I think, has been terrific. The PACT Act offsite meetings were accredited mm -hmm. to VSOs are invited to participate in those. The outreach you're doing in the communities, they're inviting our local VSOs to participate <coughs> in those as well. So we're, we're, we're creating more work for you as well as we're out there doing the same thing. We did 390 information seminars last year, and it was really geared towards PACT Act. Uh, making sure people are aware and, and getting them to file their claims. Going forward, uh, what, what do you need help with? What can we help you with? Whether it's funding, any type of legislation. We know you're hiring a lot of people. Um, but anything that we can help you with in particular, uh, as a lot of our members meet with their state legislators, so it'd be good for them to know if there's anything they should be pushing for for us. I think that one, thank you for the offer. I absolutely appreciate that. And as I said at the beginning, we definitely don't exist alone in this ecosystem. We all need each other. There's a lot more collaboration among NCA, VHA, VBA than I've seen in years. And certainly with DAV and the other VSOs and us. I think that the fact we're getting more claims is a great problem to have. We need to get more awareness. I would say when my father got out of the Vietnam War is when he got out of the Army. He joined the Army National Guard, but he didn't access any benefits from VA because he lived in literally nowhere in Missouri, in a town called Doolittle, Missouri. Any Army people lived in Fort Leonard Wood. This is the town right next to Fort Leonard Wood, which is not called Fort Lost in the Wood for nothing. So there are no other, <laughs> there are no VSOs in town. There were no people talking about benefits. And then when he passed away, my stepmom didn't know about DIC because I, even though I worked at VA, I hadn't heard of DIC because I'm a loan guy. I knew, you want to know about a mortgage, I could tell you about a mortgage. So she learned, out, learned about that later. I want to find people like my dad and my stepmom and make sure they do know about what their benefits are before. Because if my dad would have filed for benefits when he was alive, DIC would have been a whole lot easier for her. So one, I need awareness. Two, and we'll definitely want to talk about this later, there's a whole new cottage industry of people trying to help veterans access benefits, and they don't do it for free, and I think the right price to pay to access the benefits you earn is free. We do it for them every day. You do it for them every day. <clears throat> and we'll talk more about it later, but I think we need to start identifying and holding those people to account because they are not doing veterans any service. Even though some of them might have a good heart, they should not take money out of veterans' pockets that they've earned. Couldn't agree more and looking forward to continued yeah. partnerships and doing more outreach together, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Joy. Dr. Sa, similar to Jim's question to uh, Mr. Fru, the successful implementation of the PACT Act required the toxic exposed veterans were made aware of, of their new health care eligibility, as well as making sure that um, they can be screened and uh, preparing to, you know, make sure that they um, know about that eligibility and getting the screening and um, providing the health care. Do you see any issues or can you at least let us know what you're facing on the health care mm -hmm. side of things? Sure. You know, I, I think we're making great progress. Uh, back on July 26th, uh, Mr. Jacobs and Dr. Elnahal was in a uh, PACT Act implementation hearing uh, where they were able to update Congress on um, our progress to date. And they were very pleased with our progress to date. And they really encouraged us to continue what we're doing to expand outreach and ensure that we get more veterans, more benefits, and more health care. Um, Dr. Elnahal this week actually uh, spent a week um, visiting uh, facilities around PACT Act events. Uh, he was actually up in uh, East Orange, um, the VAMC up there. Um, I, I was very disappointed that he didn't invite me to go with him on that one. Um, because I actually grew up on the border of East Orange, um, right on the West Orange side, um, in this very poor Irish-Italian neighborhood. Um, and, you know, again, I was very nostalgic because I, I remember we used to have, like, our street, we used to have another street, and then we used to uh, meet in the middle in this Lily Marlene's parking lot and have rumbles. Um, <laughs> but, 
our communities were so poor that all of the kids couldn't afford weapons, so we used to steal cafeteria knives and have like fights in the <laughs> Lily Marley parking lot. So anyway, so I, I, the point of that, <laughs> uh, uh, me telling you about these times. Yeah. <laughs> the point of that is that you know uh, we're very actively out there um, talking about the Pact Act. So he's up at East Orange. Uh, we had representatives from the White House. We had representatives from Congress. Um, so we're making a lot of progress there. And I think the recurring theme that we see is that in order for Pact Act to be fully successful, we rely on both internal and external partnerships, including VSOs. DAV, et cetera. Um, they're a critical part of our, our, our way to success on the PACT Act. Uh, to share a few, I think, interesting facts about this. So um, we've had 1.8 million PACT Act direct mail letters um, that were sent. Um, so they should, uh, we should have 1.8 million veterans with those letters in hand. Um, that basically encourage veterans to enroll in healthcare and enroll in benefits. We've trained more than 88,000 providers from all different um, disciplines to perform the toxic screen exposures. Uh, we have screened 4.1 million veterans so far in this year. Wow. We have, and of those that we've screened, 1.8 million, or roughly 44%, have required follow-on visits for further evaluation. 1.7 million, 42% of veterans reported that they believe that they were exposed to at least one of the exposures from the exposure um, category list. Mm -hmm. So again, we're, we're making important impacts and really getting out there. 4.1 million veterans screened in one year. That is a phenomenal um, accomplishment from my perspective. Um, and as we welcome new veterans and provide more care um, to those already in our system, we're really focused on building the capacity that's necessary to provide more care for more veterans. So we're really focused on hiring, we're focused on improving our access standards, we're uh, focused on infrastructure. Um, as an example, um, we just signed memoranda of agreement with two academic affiliates at Stanford and uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania to expand our clinical spaces there. Um, throughout the course of the summer, we've had 130 um, PACT Act events. Uh, we call it the Summer Vet Fest, um, where we're, again, we're encouraging veterans to sign up, learn more about this, and really get the benefits that um, they deserve. Uh, I did want to take the opportunity to mention a few dates that are important. Um, we are focused on this kind of 11th hour push to get veterans and survivors to um, apply for PACT Act benefits. Um, applying before August 9th or filing a intent to file by August 9th is actually very important because if the benefits are granted, um, those benefits will be backdated to August 10th of last year. Right? So August 9th is an actual, actually a really important uh, date because um, you know, August 10th being the date that President Biden signed this into law, it allows you to get kind of retroactive um, benefits uh, that extend a year back. I think the other date that I would put out there is that post 9-11 combat veterans who served, um, who served um, have healthcare enrollment periods that go through September 30th of this year as well. So two important dates to keep in mind. Thank you. Jim? Thank you, Joy. Toxic exposure risk activity, Tara, one of our favorite subjects to mm -hmm. talk about. Um, as you know, VA has a duty to assist veterans in supporting their claims for conditions related to Tara, which includes exposure to Agent Orange, radiation, mustard gas, burn pits, or water at Camp Lejeune. Even if the veteran does not specifically claim it that way, that includes obtaining exams and medical opinions for those veterans. And we receive inquiries. We've had lots of discussion on this at the PACT Act offsites. Can you talk about why terror requirement is so important for veterans and how it's impacting the claims process, particularly the additional workload for exams and medical opinions since the enactment of the PACT Act? Yeah, I think that when Ryung was just talking about the just toxic exposure screenings, that 44% of the 4.1 million veterans that you've screened, screened positive for some type of toxic exposure. It turns out as we look at service members and veterans, former service members, service, 
serving in the military presents a lot of opportunities for exposure to toxins, whether it's, it's through burn pits, through Agent Orange herbicide exposure, through the things listed in the PACT Act, or as garrison exposures, where there's a fuel spill at, you know, just anywhere, getting gas in your car and there's a fuel spill, that's a potential toxic exposure that a veteran could look at and say, I was exposed to something. And that happened more often than not. So almost 50% of the veterans that do a toxic exposure screening, screen positive. Toxic exposure risk activity as defined in the PACT Act is is concerning to us for a couple things, and not just from the workload for VA or the exams that, that will go out, but it's, it's for the potential raised false hope maybe for veterans that say, hey, I've got this toxic exposure risk activity, then next thing I should have is, is a rated disease from VA. Even if it's not a presumptive, I was exposed to toxins, and there's a very good chance I can be, be rated for this disease. In a typical duty to assist transaction for a claim, we are required to order an exam when we have insufficient information to make a decision, whether it's positive, grant for the veteran, or negative, which is a deny. Under Terra, we're required to not only look through every single element of the veteran's experience, military personnel file, anything they give us for a potential of a toxic exposure, which we'll assume is gonna be there for most veterans, but we have to look for it, whether they claim it or not. If we don't have enough evidence to grant a claim, we have to order an exam. So the old burden is if you can't make a decision, grant or deny you order an exam. Now if we can't grant, we have to order an exam. And order an exam will add another 20 to 30 days to a claim. It will add scheduling and hassle to a veteran. And what we've seen so far is it's not adding a large percentage to the granting category for claims. So when we were predicting workload or projecting workload, TIRA on top of PAC claims is adding a whole nother half, you know, 30 days or so, say a month to the process for potentially two plus million claims a year that we're getting in. So it's definitely gonna impact veterans whether they have a toxic exposure risk activity or not because it's taking so long for us to tell whether they do and everyone in the inventory, of which there's 950,000 claims and veterans waiting for a decision on a claim today, it's only gonna make that wait longer. And so we're very focused on that to say, what are ways we can do to help your servicing officers help our VSRs and our VSRs get through the thought process of examining whether Terra exists, taking the right action, ordering, ordering an exam as quickly as we can. And we've done some, we've provided some job aids and tools to help people go through that. We're looking at automation to help us go through that. And we're also talking with VSOs like you, with Congress to say, is there any other way we can think about the toxic exposures of veterans that won't cause such a, a potentially long-term impact for them to wait for decisions that aren't necessarily gonna be favorable for them. Well, I, I think that's a great point. And you, you talked about false hope and kind of setting them up that they're not sure what the decision's gonna be and they might have some potential benefits. The, the PACT Act added over 20 new categories of presumptive uh, diseases that really can consist of probably over 300 different potential mm -hmm. diseases. Does VA intend on um, presenting a list so people do know exactly what they may be entitled to? Well, you know, it's kind of funny because Congress decided that head cancer is a presumptive, but I'm not a doctor. I don't think head cancer is a thing. I think you get carcinoma of the face or you get something in some body part, brain cancer or other things. So we have to go through head cancer and neck cancer and other aspects that they wrote and define what it is. So va.gov has a list of what we have today. I would say it's probably not exhaustive as science changes and we add and subtract different things to the list, but definitely on va.gov, we've got hundreds of listed disabilities that could help your servicing officers as they're looking to, to help veterans file for claims. But at the end of the day, I would say, if you don't feel good and you think what you don't feel good about was caused by your service or exacerbated, have a veteran file a claim because presumptive or not, we're gonna look for a way to, to attach that to their service. Excellent, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we'll switch topics here um, and talk uh, hopefully a little bit about IT modernization and the electronic health record um, initiative. 
Modernization of VA's electronic health record system is integral to the delivery of, of quality patient care, and it's central to the future of the VA healthcare system. However, the rollout of the Oracle Cerner EHR system has been put on another pause due to problems documented by GAO and other, um, the Office of the Inspector General. What um, has VA done to address those issues identified, and what efforts are underway to ensure that regardless of uh, what how things move forward, that patient safety remains the number one priority during this IT transition period? Sure. Um, I think what we know is that we know that a new federal electronic health record will be beneficial to veterans overall. We know that it will help improve health outcomes. We know that it will lead to better care coordination. We know that it will add coherence to the largest healthcare system in the country. Right? So we know that um, we must remain committed to successfully implementing a federal electronic health record. What we also know is that the current effort has not met our expectations, and it hasn't met the expectations of our patients, it hasn't met the expectations of our providers, and we want to hold ourselves and we want to hold Oracle Cerner accountable to make sure that we're doing it properly. So after considerable feedback from veterans, our frontline staff, from our partners at OIG and GAO, uh, we've halted all work on future deployments of the electronic health record. And what we plan to do is we're um, focused really on three things. Uh, number one, we do have one future deployment at the James Lavelle uh, Federal Health um, uh, Center that is scheduled for March of 2024. So part of the work that we're doing is to ensure that that launch is done um, successfully and that we've learned from any lessons from our prior experiences. I think the second thing that we're focused on is we have five current sites. Those five current sites, we're doing a, a very thorough review of what are the things that we've learned during the initial implementation, what are the things that we can improve to ensure that those five sites are operating um, uh, properly. And then number three, we're really developing the plan for future uh, deployments. Because we recognize that this is an inv investment that is absolutely necessary for the VHA, we want to do it properly, and we're learning from the experience uh, the first time around. I think the other thing that is um, important to recognize is that electronic health record implementation in any healthcare system is always challenging. Uh, so I come from the commercial you know, health space, and I don't know of any EHR implementation that has gone smoothly the first time around, right? And so I think when you add the fact that we're dealing with 171 facilities, 1,300, excuse me, 171 VA medical centers or hospitals, 1,300 facilities, um, that we're gonna encounter some challenges, but we're very focused on it, and I think we have a, a good plan to relaunch after the program reset. Great, I think that's um, really important. This is something that as long as I've been around, at least for the last 25 plus years, um, attempts have been made time and time again to do this, and I know the Secretary has made the commitment and Dr. Al Nahal um, that this has got to happen. Um, it's got to bring VA into the, you know, modernize the system that's very complicated to apparently replace with VISTA. But, um, you know, we hope that um, that's going to be successful. And we always pray for you, you know, when you have to go before Congress <laughs> and um, tell them about what's happening. I know they um, not have not always been kind at some times, but, you know, it, it does get frustrating. We really want to see this. Uh, and if I, there's anything we can do to help, mm -hmm. we're certainly monitoring the situation. We're having meetings with you, and we appreciate um, the updates and the routine um, and all the efforts. Absolutely, and, and I have a great deal of confidence in the talents of our leadership and of our staff to implement this correctly, right? Um, as many of you may know, 
the Veterans Health Administration was the leader in the launch of electronic health records. We were the leaders in qu the quality movement. Yeah, you guys may remember when Dr. Kaiser was like transforming the VHA. The entire commercial health system looked to the VA and said, we have a lot to learn from the Veterans Health Administration. Um, we know that we're capable of doing that. And I think the, um, you know, the effort so far on the federal EHR, it has been challenging. But we also know that we have the right orientation. We're very mission-focused folks. And we know how to kind of get to uh, a better way forward on this. Great. Thank you. Jim? Thanks, Joy. The backlog of claims, as anticipated, you know, over 700,000 claims filed as, as a result of PACT Act. The backlog, uh, the, the actual the number of claims pending is just under a million, and, and uh, the backlog is nearing 300,000. Uh, can you talk about VBA's plans to lower and ultimately eliminate the backlog? Uh, and when do you think you would see some progress in regards to eliminating the backlog? We, uh, well, backlog, just so everyone understands, is a claim in inventory. We have almost a million claims in inventory. Backlog claims are those claims that are more than 125 days old, so say four months. And the number was arbitrary and it was picked for us. So we're not necessarily, I wouldn't agree that every claim could be decided in less than four months. For example, radiation claims from the 50s and 40s and 60s take a lot of research and a lot of time. So four months is not realistic for them. But we absolutely want to give veterans a decision as quickly as we can. The receipts, the amount of claims we're getting in is terrific lately. It's through the roof. We're, we got 14,000 claims uh, early this week, this past Monday or Tuesday, which I thought was tremendous. And then we got 17,000 claims in two days later. So we're getting more claims in on any day than I've ever seen before. In fact, this July is our third highest receipts ever. Wow. And the second highest receipts is two months ago, so May. And the first highest is back when Nehmer came into place, and on one day we had 180,000 claims established. So we throw that out, that's 12 years ago, 10 years ago. Right now, we're getting more claims each month than any month before. And if that continues, the backlog is gonna grow, the inventory is gonna grow. But we're doing a couple things to make sure that veterans get timely decisions. One, we're trying to hire and train staff as fast as we can, and we've hired 22% more people in the last year and a half since fiscal year 22 than at any other time in our history. We're bigger than ever. We're trying to find ways to train people more quickly, and we can tell that it works because our people are producing faster. They're doing more decisions, more close to their hiring date than we expected. And we model all of this out. We have very smart, quantitative people that say you hire 100 people off the street, you put them in training, that takes some of your people that know what they're doing to train, and then you have to mentor that takes other trained people out of production. So it actually slows production when we hire because we're taking trained people out to get the new people up to speed, but it's an investment that will have a long-term gain because we'll be stronger at the end of the way. We are training people faster, they are productive faster. And then what I mentioned earlier, your former national commander, Rob Reynolds, in the front row here, we made one of the best decisions ever about two and a half years ago when we said we want to create a deputy undersecretary position for automation. And we picked Rob, because Rob had done a ton of stuff over the years before in Loan Guarantee and Stakeholder Enterprise Portal, created eBenefits, if any of you used eBenefits, which basically ported over to, uh, to VA.gov. He has a group of people that are creating processes that make everything faster for us. I mentioned earlier that years ago, a really good production day was 6,000. Last year it was 7,000, this year it's 8,000. I fully expect we'll be at nine or 10,000 in the next couple years because we have more people can do more and because of what we're doing in automation. So when I talk about a deputy undersecretary for automation, I wanna be clear what that is because it's a couple things. You know, one, it's automating repetitive tasks so that people don't have to do boring things. So we have excellent electronic health records in VA. It's not a single system that we want in the future, but we still have excellent electronic health records. Our VSRs have to gather evidence. We have a duty to assist veterans. When they file a claim, they go into our corporate database and they pull records over into 
uh, the E folder in VBMS. That might take 10 minutes or 15 minutes per veteran, but we're getting record number of claims. So if we get two and a half million claims this year, and we can save 10 or 15 minutes per claim, that's about 650,000 hours of time that's saved. Or to put in the eyes of personnel, it's about 330 people that work for a year to do just pulling claims information over from uh, health records. And for the veteran's perspective, it's probably 110 to 120,000 claims that we can do just for saving 10 minutes per claim or 15 minutes per claim. So that's one type of automation. Another type of automation is taking advantage of something that started ages ago, where we started digitizing every piece of paper that VBA has. We went to all of our regional offices that were somewhere, actually, the floors were sagging under the yeah. weight of the files that we had, and John Stewart had a field day talking about that. But we started scanning. We sent, we sent trucks of people to take files, comp compile them, say which files are where, put them in boxes, seal them, put them in a truck, escort them to an off-site scanning facility, and then store them forever, and not in our RO. We've scanned billions of pages of documents that we now have advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning that allow us to let a computer look through thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of pages in each veteran's record and say, how much of this record relates to a particular diagnostic code or a particular a disease, and it will present that as evidence to a rater. And if we can use electronic AI and, and machine learning to look at a record as soon as you file, if you were to file a claim today, Ryung, it would go to an automatic scanning center that would load it into our system. It would scour it and say, are you claiming something that we already know a lot about that we can automatically look for keywords for medicines that you've taken, diagnoses in your past, or any type of of analysis that would say, yes, this is likely to affect you. If we don't have enough evidence, the automation can automatically order an exam before a human even sees it. That's all on day one. If it does have enough information to make a decision, on day one, it could go to a rater, and the rater can be ready to look at that and say, on day one, no one's looked at your claim, but I will now have a cheat sheet, like a Cliff Notes version of your evidence that I can examine and say, does this look like it's sufficient to rate a claim? Those are the types of tools that we're giving to our raters and that your people should start to see as well in the e-file that will help people see what does this veteran have that can help us get to a decision faster. It's a massive amount of change management because you're asking people trust what something else is looking for. But in the old days, people would put on those little rubber finger things and they would page through hundreds <laughs> of pages, thousands of pages, and look for evidence. Now we're saying, let someone do it. And I would say it reminds me when I first used Google. I can remember the day I was at a client site when I was at Pricewaterhouse and this lady said, this is the most amazing thing. It's a white page with a box that says, I'm feeling lucky. And you type in something and you say, I'm feeling lucky and it tells you a result. Now, 15 years later, we don't even question it. It's just, <laughs> it searches it, we trust it. Like if it says the score of the Nats game is this, I'm not gonna look somewhere else and see if it's right. I know it's right. And that's what we need our people to get used to in the automation in our world. Well, the automation has been terrific, and we've worked closely with Rob and his team. And, and I remember, I, I visited a scanning facility in, in, in Janesville yeah. and got to see how big of a production that is and how accurate it is. So it's very impressive. Um, but I think automation, I think a lot of people were under the impression that, well, if someone's auto, they're automatically, a computer's deciding my claim, and that's not accurate. It, there's still a person making a decision on the claim. It's a decision support tool. It's supporting that person making the decision and, ga and helping them gather all the evidence. So I appreciate you clarifying that. That was very helpful. Oh, and I love that term, decision support tool. It is definitely a human being that's making the final adjudication. Yep, I appreciate you saying that. Joy. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Dr. Sa, the number of women and minority veterans using VA healthcare system continues to rise, and we know that it's expected to further increase over the next decades. What is VA doing to ensure women and minority veterans, including racial, ethnic, and LGBTQ plus veterans, have equitable access to VA programs and specialized services? I think when it comes to um our efforts around health equity or promoting health equity, I'd say we, we have three primary levers. I think the first lever is around making sure that we have good data and analysis so that we understand where the health disparities may be. 
So, for example, one of the initiatives we have is, um, you know, if we have incomplete data on, um, you know, race, ethnicity, sex, gender, those types of things, um, we know that the gold standard for identification of those things ends up being self-reporting. So we are opening up the va.gov portal for veterans to be able to come in and correct their records directly. Right? I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy way or an easy fix to ensure that the data itself is more accurate than we, we might currently have. We also have um, a lot of um, analytical dashboards and metrics. So we have things like the, uh, the National Veterans Health Equity Report and the LGBTQ plus patient-centered care tool. And it really allows us to conduct operational um, analyses to, again, determine where are the best ways that we can start to develop strategies for reducing health disparities. I think the third is actually around outcomes, and outcomes are actually very, very difficult um, typically to analyze, um, but we have um, uh, something called the Primary Care Equity Dashboard, and that's population-based data, and we can actually look at how are we doing on, for example, blood pressure control, or how are we doing on diabetes control, so outcomes-level data, and then be able to go ahead and take a look at all of our demographic, demographic factors to determine is there a health disparity that we're seeing within one of our um, subpopulations inside the VHA. So these are very powerful tools that um, not a lot of, um, you know, frankly, a, a lot of other communities are able to do, but because we have such a large you know, closed, well, it used to be a closed healthcare system, um, it allows us to conduct this uh, analysis at a level of granularity that you don't commonly see. I think the second lever that we see is around the quality improvement. So, you know, what good is it to know that there are health disparities? What can we do to act upon those and improve upon those? So we have an equity-based quality improvement portfolio that is really focused on what are we doing around when we identify a health um, inequality or a health equity issue? How are we improving the situation? So we have a, um, the Office of Health Equity has a number of clinical themes that they focus on. So we have quality improvement um, projects underway that are focused on re uh, reducing disparities on the use of newer diabetes medications, on the use of uh, statin medication use and adherence to medications. Um, we're advancing uh, the health of uh, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander populations where we've seen a lot of uh, disparities. Um, and really, all of these types of projects focus on eliminating health disparities as we find them. I'd say the third lever is really around education and training types of tools and opportunities. So we have, um, we have a lot of programs that are really focused on developing and um, disseminating tools around minority veterans, women veterans, a lot of other veterans that are um, you know, priority populations for us. You know, Secretary McDonough has um, said to us many times and reaffirmed his commitment to making sure that VA is a harassment-free environment, including you know, gender-based harassment and sexual assault across the department. And I know that was an important thing to him right from the beginning um, when he came in. Could you provide our members an update on the VA's White Ribbon campaign and the department's efforts on this important initiative? Uh, sure. It, it, it is a priority for the, um, the VA more broadly, definitely within the VHA as well, uh, where we want to promote awareness as an effort to prevent um, and end harassment and sexual assault um, through this White Ribbon uh, VA campaign. So it's a national call to action um, and um, uh, as a way to promote positive change within your organization. Um, it's a opportunity to where all, regardless of gender, can participate. Uh, it was inspired by the White, White Ribbon organization, which is the world's largest movement to to end violence against women and girls. Um, more than 300,000 VA employees, uh, veterans and um, partners have taken the White Ribbon VA pledge to date. Um, we have uh, a White Ribbon VA champion at every VA medical facility. 
Uh, we ensure that every new employee has the opportunity to take the white ribbon pledge um, throughout our entire staff. And all of our SES swearing in ceremonies always end with a white ribbon um, uh, VA pledge ceremony. Uh, DAV has been a key partner in promoting the, the White Ribbon VA Pledge as well. Uh, you've helped us get commitments from veterans who are part of the DAV through your outreach and your programming. And uh, again, we just continue to um, promote and we remain committed uh, to the White Ribbon campaign. Great. Well, that's such, so important and we've, um, our leadership has been 100% behind that and making sure that we can help to do our part. We want to just make sure that every veteran who needs to use the VA healthcare system can go and not have any exp poor experience um, with regard to any type of harassment. You know, the VA provides such unique and specialized services and it's critical that every veteran get the opportunity to use that and not want to be dissuaded from going because of a poor experience. So, I know our members, uh, it's important to them as well and want to help do their part um, and watch out for everybody while we're there and make sure we report something if we see it. Thank you. Jim? Thank you, Joy. We filed nearly 175,000 claims for over half a million issues last year and 97% 90, of those were done electronically. And we really depend on VA, VBA's core systems to allow us to do that, whether it's VBMS, SEP. Uh, and, and the whole point behind that is that we're getting the information from there, making sure that the claim is filed correctly uh, and coming to VBA appropriately, which helps you process it quicker. Do you guys have any um, thoughts about sunsetting any of the systems? Or, you know, VBMS as an example has been around now it's been 12 years, I think. So I will know. never forget VBMS. <laughs> <laughs> so just curious on what your thoughts are on that. I, we know the stakeholder enterprise portal is likely going away at some point. Yes. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful tool for VSOs. So I'm hoping we can get something in place before that sunset. But I know that's a big ask as well. I would say, well, one, we can't do any of our work without systems now. They're so, everything is so complex, the world is so interrelated that we need to gather far more information than ever before to accomplish just about anything. We rely on our systems, we rely on you who rely on our systems as well. So given that and knowing that we're always trying to make our systems better. There's no system that's rolled out since even when I worked in the private sector that you're just happy with it when it's done. You're constantly adding features, adding enhancements, getting it to keep up with the day's technology, the day's needs, the ability to do things more quickly or to handle more data. Um, but kind of funny story, when I worked in investment banking, no one ever thought that numbers would have a billion in them, like a dollar value of a billion. So they made all of the dollar values in this huge multinational investment bank to stop at $999,999,999.99. And we first started to get billion dollar transactions, none of the systems worked. So clearly that needed to change. And we're in the same, same place with most of our systems. We have a backbone of payment system that's under a comprehensive top to bottom fix in our office of finance, our CIO, CFO's office. And that's been underway for a decade and really, really hard the last couple of years. And it's called FMBT for any that work, work with us. But for any payment that goes out of VA, that's gonna be the new backbone. In education, we have an old system that's based on COBOL that's been around forever that we're trying to get rid of called Benefits Delivery Network. Most of our systems were attached to that over the years. Most have been unattached and built in new ways now, but education service is still really, really comprehensively linked to that. So fortunately, VBMS is not linked to B BDN. VBMS is relatively fresh, even if it's 10 years old or a decade old, and I remembered it because they evicted us in loan guarantee and took our office space when they started designing <laughs> VBMS. So I'll never forget VBMS. But it's also the backbone for most of what we do. And if we make changes to it, we have regular cadence of meetings with you and the other big VSOs to say what works for you, what helps you. So one, there's no immediate changes in the future of VBMS other than iterative development. Two, SCP is old. And I know it's old because Rob built it, and Rob built it a long time ago. <laughs> so SEP has to grow, and it has to evolve. 
I don't know what the future is going to be, but I want to make sure that you have the functionality that you need. You know, I talked to Marty Carraway, who's our VSO liaison. I can't see well because it's so bright, but somewhere out here, that if you need something and you don't think we're hearing, talk to him. If you feel like he's not listening, talk to me or Josh, because we know that we can't deliver benefits without you. So if you need something to help us deliver benefits, it's in our interest and it's in your interest to make sure you have it. All right, thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. Dr. Sa, VA's number one clinical priority is to prevent veteran suicide. And there have been a number of new VA initiatives to ensure veterans have access to timely mental health services, and especially to assist veterans who are in acute um, mental health crisis. Last year, the 988 Suicide Crisis Lifeline was launched as part of the national effort uh, to reduce veteran or suicide, including veterans. Can you talk about VA's perspective, how the rollout went, um, and how bro more broadly give us an update on VA's comprehensive mental health and suicide prevention strategies and plans for the future? Sure, uh, absolutely. Suicide prevention um, remains our number one clinical priority. Um, so since the launch of the uh, Dial 9, 988 um, Press One campaign, the Veteran Crisis Line staff have fielded uh, mil nearly a million contacts. Um, this includes more than 800,000 calls, over 65,000 text messages, and greater than 100,000 chats. This translates to roughly a 12% increase in calls, a 45% increase in texts, and a 9% uh, increase in chat messages over the preceding year. So despite this growth, our average speed to respond on the uh, veteran crisis line is 9.3 seconds which is below our 10 second um, standards. And the abandonment rate is 1.5%. Uh, so we're trying to keep that below 5%, so we're doing um, okay on that. But in order to prepare for and to continue to support the growing demand, the, uh, the Veteran Crisis Line has bolstered our workforce by over 900 new employees. Uh, this includes responders, supervisors, peer support specialists, and other support staff. So, as of July 16th of this year, the Veteran Crisis Line has 1,806 full-time equivalents, of which 1,096 employees are crisis responders. Uh, speaking more generally about our suicide prevention and mental health um, strategies, we remain committed to mental health um, integration into our primary care and other specialty um, experiences. So um, we have worked hard to ensure that we have mental health professionals and behavioral health specialists available where veterans need it most, where they receive their care. So we've integrated mental health professionals into primary care, into our oncology clinics, into our pain clinics, and we continue to look for other areas where it makes a lot of sense for us to integrate mental health professionals. Um, I think the uh, suicide prevention um, strategies, since the creation of the VA suicide prevention program in 2007, VA has onboarded more than 400 suicide prevention coordinators um, who provide the care coordination training and outreach to at-risk veterans. We also have a program called Reach Vet, which was developed with the VA and the National Institutes of Mental Health, which is designed to uh, conduct a predictive analysis model to identify the veterans who are at highest risk of suicide. And so through the Reach Vet program, we've identified more than 6,000 veterans who are at increased risk for suicide. Our outreach, um, our attempted outreach um, percentages are at 99%. So we identify a high risk veteran. We've been able to uh, make an attempt at greater than 99%. And our rate of successful outreach um, has reached 88%. So, um, we still have room for improvement, but I, I think it's progress in helping us identify uh, our veterans who are at greatest risk. Um, but obviously, it, it's, it's not enough. Right? Um, I think some of the other things that are important uh, that I would share is uh, the Compact Act. The Compact Act, for those who may not be familiar, is um, if any veteran enrolled or non-enrolled inside the VHA, 
Um, you can go to any VA or community care, community health care facility for emergency treatment with no out-of-pocket costs. Right? So th this, is, this includes your transportation, related prescriptions, inpatient, um, and crisis residential care for up to 30 days, and other crisis-related outpatient care for up to 90 days. So this really is a um, remarkable um, opportunity for veterans who are not even enrolled in our system to receive the care that they need. So uh, the current estimates are roughly about 9 million veterans who are not enrolled in the VA would be eligible to receive um, care under the Compact Act. Um, I guess the last statement I would say is that the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention's mission is to promote, protect, and restore veterans' mental health and overall well-being, to empower and equip them to achieve their life goals, and to provide quality state of the, um, health care in a timely manner. And this is something that the entire VHA and the VA is committed to. Thank you. Jim? Thanks, Joy. Mike, in an effort to improve accuracy and consistent, uh, consistent claims for PTSD claims based upon military sexual trauma, VBA consolidated all the military sexual trauma-related claims under the control of the Puerto Rico VA Regional Office. Can you talk about whether this has improved either the accuracy uh, of the claims or led to improved timeliness? Um, that's a process that's still underway. So the MST, or military sexual trauma claims, are a subset of claims that has obviously been very important to us in VA, and it's gotten a lot of, a lot of uh, consideration in the last several years for how do we best handle not just the claims, but the claimants. What is the best way for us to help a veteran who has experienced a traumatic event during service, a sexually charged event during service, and try to touch them in a way that's compassionate, that's trauma-informed, that will allow them to hopefully not relive their experience, but get to a point where we can get them the care and the benefits that they need, especially the mental health care, so that they can start to move on with their lives and to recover. So we've gone through a lot of different evolutions in how we handle MST. We did create, right now, it's, I would call it a virtual regional office, so it's under the charge of the director of the San Juan regional office, but it's not a San Juan function. It's a nationwide function. There are hundreds of employees, VSRs and RVSRs around the country, who all they do is focus on MST claims. That's been under consolidation for the last several months, I would say six months or so, as we went from several centers to this virtual regional office. We have more MST claims than ever. And I wouldn't say it's because processing time's down. Processing time is going fairly well. I think outreach and information and awareness of the fact that VA is here to help. Uh, we've got more people that are more aware of signs in veterans. And in fact, I had a former deputy undersecretary that called me and said, Mike, I was on a, a cruise of all places and I met a veteran who wouldn't talk about her service and I think it's because of an MST. I couldn't get her to talk to me. Her husband said that she's never talked to him about it. Can we get someone to talk to her? So I actually reached out to VHA, and we got someone from VHA to talk to her in a way that allowed her to feel safe and secure and to relate her experience so we could then determine a claim and get her connected to help. That's one veteran. And there's right now 30,000 or so uh, veterans who have experienced an MST who are in a system. We want them all to get connected to care as soon as, as soon as possible because they deserve the care. One, they've earned it. Two, they should have never had to go through that in the first place. We want to get them to the care that they need. So the timeliness is still a little bit more. We want it to be done in less than 125 days is our goal. Timeliness is about 146 days right now for MST claims. I would say that they are complex because what we get from claimants is sometimes relatively small and we have to infer a lot from evidence because we are not trying to cause these people to relive the experience that cause them to need to file a claim in the first place. So we're getting better at our trauma-informed communication, at eliciting the only the information we need from veterans. We're getting better at looking at buddy statements and, and I forget the word that we 
we use, but looking for signs in a veteran's experience if they had a perfect, perfect uh, behavior record and then all of a sudden everything looked bad, if their attendance looked bad, if their insubordination all of a sudden started on a date, then we could use those as markers and say, hey, we don't have to know everything, but we can see consequences of what could be found. So the claims themselves are a little bit more complex, but as we get better, as we get our people uh, more experience in it, I think we're going to have to consider in the future what's the long-term impact on VSRs and RVSRs when the only type of claim that they're seeing day in and day out is military sexual trauma because it's gonna take a certain amount of compassion on their part and I'm very worried about what the long-term impact for them will be. But we're going through this journey with a lot of people and I would say it's definitely faster for veterans filing out. It's definitely more equitable for veterans because we're better at winnowing out the information that we need from their service to determine whether this, ex this experience happened. Thank you, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Joy. Well, Jim, I see that we're just about out of time, and um, I know that we wanted to give you both an opportunity to make any closing remarks or comments about maybe an issue we haven't covered um, here today or to expand on something more that you thought about. So, Dr. Sal, I'll let you start. But I have more notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure that I have an issue that I would... Um, particular highlight, but I, I, I'm, I'm actually reminded of um, a TED talk that I watched. Uh, it's a woman named uh, uh, Emily Esfahani Smith, and uh, she was talking about, she had done a lot of, uh, many years of research to determine what are the sources of meaning in one's life, right? And she identified the four main pillars of meaning in one's life. It's mission, belonging, storytelling or, and transcendence. So the meaning behind it was that all of us need to have some kind of meaningful um, purpose that we kind of fix our lives around. Second, we need to have a sense of belonging to a broader community. Third, we need some kind of narrative arc to our life story. And fourth, we need to feel like we're, we're that our lives are greater than ourselves, right? And so when I think about that, and I think about our own mission within the, the VHA, I think about that mission, right, first and foremost. So what the VA does, what the VHA does, it always reminds me that this is why it is so meaningful for all of us. When I come to something like a DAV national convention, I'm reminded of the second pillar, right, which is that sense of belonging. And um, again, I feel it's a, it's a great honor, it's a tremendous privilege to be able to spend time with this community that we all feel like we belong to. Um, so for me, it's, it's been a very powerful experience to, to be here. Um, this is actually my very first VSO presentation. It's the first one I've been invited to. Actually, I wasn't invited, but the first one <laughs> <laughs> I was last minute injected into, but, um, but it's been a, a pleasure to spend some time with you. So. Great, well we've had, um, it's been a pleasure having you and we were so appreciative that you could uh, fill in. I know Dr. Al Nahal wanted to be here, but um, I think this is such an important opportunity for you to meet face to face with some of our members and them to see you and um, we know how dedicated um, everyone is up there at VHA and within VBA and how hard you work to make sure things um, are really working for our veterans. So Jim, I'll turn it back to you for Mr. Fruit. Thanks, Joy. Mike, I do have one more question. So yeah. You're not getting off that easy. It's a softball. <laughs> you promised that. It's a softball, but uh, you mentioned claim sharks, these unaccredited claims companies, and I really wanted everyone here to understand what this is all about. You see a lot of advertisements out there, a lot of information coming out, uh, telling veterans that they'll help help you prepare your claim. Um, these folks are not accredited, and they charge absorbent fees, whether it's six times the monthly increase that you get. Um, by law, no one is allowed to charge anybody to help you file an initial claim. Nobody can charge us fees for that. And it is happening all over the place right now. They're taking advantage of veterans and survivors, um, and they sign these contracts, and then they're held to them. 
Now they're at Congress trying to fight for the law to get changed to allow them into the process to, to charge to file initial claims. So they're breaking the law right now, and everybody knows it. Congress knows it. We see it happening all the time. They're not being punished for it, and now they're trying to get into the system legally. And it's very frustrating, and, and I've met with VA, uh, I've met with Congress. Um, veterans have sacrificed enough and paid for their benefits through their service. There's no reason why they should have to pay fees to file an initial claim. It's a non-adversarial process when you file your original claim, or any claim before the VA for that matter. So there are accredited representatives, DAV, a bunch of other VSOs out there available to you uh, that don't charge fees and will not charge fees. So make sure you're passing that word, but I, I wanted to ask Mike, you know, if VA is doing anything that could help protect veterans from these folks that we can refer to as unaccredited claims folks or sh claim sharks, whatever well, you want to call them. you're using very nice language. I am. I, I'm I a do mixed not. company, so I didn't want to. <laughs> yeah, but they're all ours. I would yeah, say that right. I don't get upset about much. And, and people that know me for a long time know that I'm pretty even keeled and pretty even tempered, but I am getting infuriated by the proliferation of people who claim to be on veterans' side who show up at TAP at the end of transition and say, sign up with me, it won't cost you a thing. I will take some of what you don't have already and I will help you get a claim. And I see ads that say, if you're not getting 80%, you're not getting 90%, you're not getting 100%, you are getting screwed. Come to us, come to our doctors. Our doctors will write the DBQ that will help you get 100% disability from VA and we will file your paperwork. Give us your va.gov sign in, give us your e-benefits if that's still alive, Rob sign in, we will pretend to be you, and we will put in your paperwork, and all you have to do is cash your check. And they are there every single month asking these veterans, I see that you've been raided, we want our money, we're here for you. So they're there to bill, they're there to catch the money. And I mentioned at the, see he agrees. I mentioned at the beginning <laughs> that we, we deliver $3 billion a week to veterans. That's a lot of money, an opportunity that there is no way that bad people are not interested in getting their hands on it. I'm not saying everyone's bad, but for the most of these people, I am furious that they're even allowed to go home at night and pretend that they care about veterans because what they'll do and what we've seen already is they will attach their name to a claim, they will take the next five or six months worth of payment increase, they will not be there to make the claim right if they did something wrong. They have no incentive to get effective date right, which is our number one error on a claim. Effective date could mean years of back pay to a veteran. How much more does it make to a company that has agreed to take five or six months of payment? They don't care. They will take the next five months. They don't need the last five months. They just need their five months. If you get the effective date wrong, who's gonna be left to fix it later? It will be your VSOs, it will be us, it will be uh, more appeals probably in the process. And I don't think they're helping the veteran a bit. You use the, the word that I like a lot. It's a non-adversarial relationship. In fact, Congress gave us the duty to assist, to help find information for veterans, gather everything they don't send us that infuriated me and my stepmom when we were trying to apply for DIC. And we already gave them everything. And they said, we're gonna go get more stuff. Like there's nothing else to get, we have that responsibility to make it easier for veterans and no one should profit off that. And it drives me nuts and I want to stop it. And we are gonna do everything we can. We've got general counsel write cease and desist letters to some of these companies. We're reaching out to DOJ for some of the more egregious ones that are absolutely violating the law. But rest assured, we know they are, if they file, or if they charge a veteran money to file a claim, they are all breaking the law and we wanna stop them. Yep. Thank you, I appreciate mm -hmm. it. So everyone, please share that information, absolutely. <laughs> Now's your opportunity to make any final comments. I was actually gonna end with Tara, because I wanted to bring it up anyway, but doc, Dr. Suss said something at the beginning that said, I'm really happy to be back in New Jersey, and I've never heard that phrase before. But, <laughs> <laughs> but now that I'm here, I would say, 
this has been a wonderful day. I hope that you guys have an excellent convention and spend a lot of time with each other. When we're back in DC, we will continue to work on claim sharks, predatory actors, jackasses, I would say, in the system and make sure that we can stop them and everything else we can help veterans access their benefits. So thank you again. Well, thank you. On behalf of Joy, myself, and DAV, we really appreciate both of you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here on a Saturday, no less. So thank you for making the trip. Um, and again, we wish you all the best, and we look forward to continue working with both of you. Everyone, please give them a big round. Thank you very much.